New from MyProtein, the protein shake that changes the game. Way Forward is better for the planet and fuels maximum performance. It's time for change. It's time for the Way Forward. Stan? Yeah, baby! Dude. <laughs> My brother. I was gonna uh I was gonna yes. record an intro, my my be like Mike intro, like Mike. I wanna be like wanna be, wanna be, wanna be like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that should be your intro and outgo. I'm going to make a little video of that. Like, okay. All right. Whatever you do, I'll post. I'll put up. I'll, I'll, if you sing to me, done. It goes up there. Great. In my next I, career. <laughs> so I would like to, you've got too much knowledge that I can appreciate on so many facets. And I don't want to, I don't want to do today and try to get all this in. I don't want to do that with you. We're going to be here for a while. Obviously, you're not going to stop. And until you stop, I'm not stopping. So I would rather stay focused today on basically one topic and then let you just dive into that topic as much as you possibly can. And if I come up with something just to veer you off for a second and pull you back in, because I have questions, um, I'll do so. Does that sound good to you? That sounds good. Just means that we're going to be in a relationship now. Yeah. Did we explain to our audience this uh, this battle that we have going? Like uh, Mike and I keep texting each other from time to time. Every time he does something ridiculous in the gym or ends up with another, I don't know, extra rib or intercostal slice. I always tell him, I said, if you quit, I'll quit. I really I want to sit on the back patio and eat bonbons by the pool. But you'd make me be feel embarrassed about myself. So. I just have to keep training. That's the only reason. If it weren't for you, I could quit. Why is that important? Because it's as much as it's important to you, I'll guarantee it's twice as much to me is why I, yeah. like, I want them to understand why that's important. It's like in today's society, I don't think uh, I don't think they have that kind of competition or don't understand it. Can you explain it? Yeah. I mean, anybody who's seen the. Uh, Michael Hearn rant will understand a little better what uh, the 30 year history that we have going all the way back to the Emerald Cup back in the early 90s. But uh, I think it has less to do with you personally than it has to do with the idea of you or the bar that you've set. It was kind of similar to when Johnny Jackson and I were going at it some years ago with the world's strongest pro bodybuilder. It, it just it creates, I think, a goal or a standard by which you want to try and hold yourself to because you know, as we progress through this, uh, this, this life, it's just a matter of trying not to decline at too rapid a pace. That's really what it's about. It's not just lifespan, but health span. And, uh, you know, how, how quickly you, you decline after a certain year, or what you allow yourself to, to accept uh, a complacency that might set in in the absence of some uh, incentive. And, and I think you've, kind of set a bar that people largely recognize as being kind of the pinnacle of uh, health and fitness, uh, even now into our 50s. And so I use those as kind of measuring sticks, uh, both the conditioning and the strength maintenance. So we're seeing a lot of the academics now that you and I uh, tend to follow behind the scenes, you know, the Peter Atias of the world and some of the, uh, you know, the people who talk about longevity, they're all, they've all come around to focus on strength, you know, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons talking about the importance of lean muscle tissue into, into older years, uh, bone mineral density and how it's all influenced by uh, sleep, diet and exercise and the optimization of those and uh, how when we're 80, we still want to be able to be, uh, you know, to be able to move around and, and complete simple tasks and get up and put your overhead bag in the, in the overhead compartment at, at, on the airplane and still travel and uh, put on our little bikini shorts and pose at, uh, at some over 70 bodybuilding show. <laughs> this is so ironic that we went down this path because I was going to go somewhere else today, but I want to stay on this for a second because can you explain the word um, sustainable? 
to me and what what the dictionary what does that mean from what you well I, it's just we measure things and, and there was a brilliant philosopher that once said uh strength is never a weakness okay it wasn't a brilliant philosopher it was mark bell and <laughs> but even a broken clock can be right twice a day right <laughs> So uh, what we're seeing now is that you reach a, a peak at some age in, in life, usually in early life. When we talk about bone mineral density for men and women in particular, it's usually by the time you're 25. We talk about lean body mass or strength associated with longevity. Uh, that's usually also a, a younger man's game. And what we're finding now in terms of sustainability is it's your ability to... <clears throat> to prevent attrition or, you know, sarcopenia is what we call it in terms of muscle loss over years. It's protective. It's, uh, it's, it's lengthens your life. You know, kind of a proxy marker we use for that is grip strength, which prompted a lot of folks to run around and start doing uh, dead hangs for time. <laughs> and it's really, again, it's just a measurement of general physical strength. And so, the idea of sustainability to me has a lot to do with, you know, you've heard me say compliance is the science, just having a routine that provides an adequate stimulus uh, and maintaining a, a healthy body mass index, uh, getting sufficient sleep and you know, doing some resistance training and some cardiovascular training. Uh, you know, the minimum standards for that is probably twice a week for resistance training and maybe 150 to 300 minutes a week of, of cardiovascular fitness. I mean, that's the foundation of it all. And it never ends. And it's, uh, you know, I've often, people often will question why we still lift with the intensity that we do. And the reason being is in the absence of sufficient intensity, there's no adequate stimulus for the body to maintain its strength long term, you'll just basically start to deteriorate. It becomes a war of attrition. Uh, and that's not to say that somebody who's been inactive that gets into their 40s and 50s and decides to start training can't accumulate significant muscle mass and lean right. bone mineral density. They certainly can. Uh, but at some point, there's going to be diminishing returns. And the goal really is can I create something that's simple, sensible, and sustainable that allows me to maintain my long-term health? And that has to, and it's, it's going to require you to provide an adequate stimulus to your body to keep it from declining in age. So that's kind of what I did. I think you, you're much brighter than I am. Um, but there's one thing that I was, I was trying to figure out the word and understand it. And so I, I checked the dictionary um, and the one word that slipped out of my mind when you talk about that longevity is can you sustain this for a long period of time? The one word was level. And I go, oh, OK, maybe I knew that at one time, but it, it slipped my mind because when I say to people, um, I've been this strong for 40 years, I was this strong at 15 and I'm this strong today. And that was 40 years ago. And so I'm sitting there going. That's what I'm trying to explain, because when I say, can you do this for a long, they, they name people. Now, they're naming people, but those people are just alive. You'll you'll understand this. You know what I mean? It's like, OK, but I'm, I'm asking you who strength wise is the same, who size wise is the same, who's the the level. You know, 87 was my first time in the magazines and we're still doing this kind of silly stuff today but it's the level that we keep, which is sustainable. And that's what I was trying to talk about. And I couldn't articulate it well enough to say, but who else is out there? And I, and I always mention you and some others. Um, but it's funny that society names people that are just still breathing. And it was interesting to me because I don't, I don't want to disrespect people like Robbie Robinson, who's freaking phenomenal. And yeah. he, he should always be mentioned for that person that's the level of it. It's well, those are our goals. Some people might have a goal to be, uh, to pursue their health and fitness to the level that we have at, in our 50s. Our goal is in our 70s, that the Robbie Robinsons of the world is, the, is our next uh, uh, bar that we're gonna be setting for ourselves or hopefully to try and maintain throughout these next 20 years. Yeah, and, and I was thinking about that because he's like, he's 25 years older than me and I'm like, 
that's awesome. I get another 25 years of this. And so Agreed. hard enough to train. So if that does happen, I'm still being able to do that at that level. Cause it's not, I want to be around in 25. I want to be at that level at 25 years from now. Yeah, not just to survive, but to thrive hundred percent. So can you help me uh, articulate this to the world that sustainable doesn't mean um, I can go in three days a week and train. I can go stay on my nutrition plan. That's great. But if you're going backwards, if the metabolism is slowing, if your body is not as dense and as strong with the bone density, if the connective tissue is falling apart, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about much deeper, much rooted. You can't go to the gym and squat like you do at that level. If you're just going, I'm in it, I'm going there, goody for me. It's like, I get that. I want to talk to the ones that go, I want to attack this. I want to talk to the warriors that go, I want to be better at 50 like Mona than when she was at 20. That's the that's what that's the world I would like to help try to create and say it's possible where the world is telling all these social media people going, that's not possible. You cannot do this. It is a hyper. It's a complete false. You can't do that. And you're fake. It's like, well, guys, it's 40 years of this. What, what what aren't you getting the possibility of if you don't make the mistakes? 100 percent. I think there's a lot of things that go on and go into that. I think one is that, that people do assume, and you mentioned that, did, does your body, uh, does your metabolism slow? And now we're seeing research that suggests between about the age of 20 and 60, it does not slow. We slow. Our activity level decreases, not our body's calorie burn. And we're seeing that now in, in the science that it's not until you get into your 60s or later. And even for those people, it would be relevant to, to mention that, uh, they probably lost a significant amount of lean muscle mass, which might influence their, their metabolism. But generally speaking, your metabolism does not slow. It's not an excuse. Uh, our activity level declines and our willingness, I hate to say ability, because some people do have uh, you know, certain conditions that, that make it harder for them to, to lift weights. and you know, by, Maybe it's an injury or, or something like that. Uh, but you'd be less inclined to be injured uh, if you would lift weights consistently for longevity. And we see this even in the academic industry. Now we see barbell medicine. I mean, barbell medicine, they prescribe weightlifting irrespective of age. They get a 60, 70 year old individual with, you know, recovering from some illness. They, they, they weight train them. We see it with uh, docs who lift uh, Dr. Nadalski, the brothers, uh, who were both, uh, you know, standout collegiate wrestlers, and now they're, they're medical practitioners, and they work with a lot of, of elderly people. And of course, I mentioned Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, and she did a lot of work with geriatrics. And one of the critical components of that is to move. My we father's 91 her. years old. We just my had pops her over. Lives, yeah, my pops is 91 years old. He lives with me. He had a hip surgery. The very next morning, they had him walking on a walker. You need to put load on the body. Uh, I talked at a seminar many years ago about when astronauts go out into space, they lose a, lose a significant amount of lean muscle tissue. And in some cases, they, they don't fully recover. And they, they work very hard to include some sort of resistance training when they're up there. Um, and they lose lean body mass. And it's, it, it can be, you know, have a huge impact on their long term health. So now we got people who, you know, first of all, understand the importance of weight training, which we just covered in order to stimulate lean body mass and bone mineral density, maintain it long-term and its benefit for, for longevity. Uh, and for all cause mortality, it, it, it definitely protects you against mortality. Okay, um, so I got to stop you for a second because you're talking factual and that's, that's textbook stuff. This is what, stay with me for a second because I think there's a bigger picture that you can talk to these people about. Yep. I always try to, I try to give them the basic because basic works. And then I try to give them the secondary, what gets them there, what gets them to the gym, what, what's yes. the consistency, because I think that's missed. Obviously, in textbooks, it's not Wolf's Law, those details of, yeah, but you got to go pound the hands and break the bones so they can rebuild and so on, or Davis Law. These things are great, but there's a missing factor of you and I are not saying any of this is easy. You and I are not saying this is like. Everybody can do this for a lifetime, but we are saying that this does help. Is there something 
that you work with on people, the mindset, because it takes us full circle back to the beginning is I cannot stand this. You, the guy that gets up and goes and trains, because that means I got to get up and go train. Yeah. Can... Okay. Well, let's transition into that. I think that was phase two of this discussion. Uh, first of all, we have to eliminate the mindset that, that your body wears out. People think that the body's degenerative over time, and it's actually regenerative with the correct stimulus. And so a lot of people will avoid lifting weights because they think that they're breaking things down. Well, that's what we call hormesis, and that's in, it's intentional and it's purposeful. It's really the benefit of vegetables, actually, is that they create some sort of uh, uh, hormetic effect that your body responds to by getting stronger at the right dose. So that's the big thing about training is, is that you can actually build, I talked about muscle tissue, bone mineral density, but also your connective tissue. You can, you can thicken uh, your spinal column. Uh, you can thick, increase the meniscus and, and uh, uh, the tendons and ligaments around your knees and, and hips and ankles. All of that only occurs with some sort of stimulus. And so let's not look at weight training as being degenerative or, or talk about things like um, wearing joints out, because that is not what happens. Actually, inactivity wears joints out. We see that in low back pain, which is one of the most common complaints as people age is low back pain. Uh, Greg Knuckles refers to uh, when people get pain, they stop moving. He calls it, they become kinesophobic. And that's the last thing you should do because then that impairs your range of motion and you get atrophy of the muscles. And the muscles is what supports those joints in order to make you pain-free. We see that in shoulder surgeries. If you don't do the rehab after shoulder surgery, you get frozen shoulder. Uh, your shoulder will actually lose range of motion and muscle tissue. So that's the important thing to get across is like, look, this stimulus is necessary. It's beneficial. Uh, we do want to break down muscle tissue and provide a, a, a resistant stimulus, some sort of axial loading, ideally a squat or a deadlift or a weighted carry so that your spinal column and your, uh, your lumbar, uh, thoracic, all of that can, can be impacted and can, then you know, maintain your, your uh, long-term health and your ability to move. So now we get into, okay, how do we, how do we affect this for people? And that's, uh, but to be cautious, the stimulus isn't too much, too much repetitive strain, too much heavy lifting. Uh, we want the weight to be sufficient, but not damaging. And it can be damaging in, in two, two ideas. Like if you, too much repetitive strain, just too many repetitions too often, can, can start to, uh, you know, break things down. I hate to use that word, break things down. But, uh, uh, you know, as we talked about in terms of the hormetic effect, you're, you're going to have to to get into a position where you're actually breaking things down a little bit so that they, they super compensate and respond by growing and getting stronger. And what we found now and what I didn't realize and what you may not have realized when we were younger men and we were powerlifting, we always thought we had to take every set to failure. Uh, we're much more cautious now and you don't have to take every set to failure. Your level intensity to get maximum muscle fiber recruitment probably only needs to be at, within two or three reps of failure. So understanding that, maybe that will take away some of the barriers to entry where people think like if they go to the gym, they have to crush themselves. They do have to lift reasonably heavy, probably more than 70% of your one rep max, but that's a 10 or 12 or 14 rep set. That's not that's not terribly heavy by what we consider in terms of one rep max, one rep max. You can get the same results from a, a heavy five rep set as you can from a, a medium 10 rep set in terms of muscle hypertrophy. <clears throat> now you can also get the same results from a light 30 rep set in terms of hypertrophy, but unless you get over 70% of your one rep max, it's not likely that you're going to get the same tendon and ligaments benefit. Okay. So hold on for be one second because I want them to fully understand this. Yeah. The high reps is great for the one aspect. And again, uh, Correct. I, I want you guys to understand when it's longevity, we're talking about the full picture and, and people uh, keep asking, why don't you ever try to fake You know, since social media came out, they always see me do these are our, our heavy weights, but then I stop and it seems like number 10 is the same as number one. And it's because I know I did enough damage to get better that day. 
but not destroying myself. And so I want them to understand when I say lift heavy, lift heavy for the rep range and the range of motion you're doing. Um, but I, I agree with the studies as well is that even though you and I go crazy at times, uh, the 30 to 40 to 50 reps is fun for a leash off kind of battle workout, but it's not a continuous thing. And I, and I want them to understand that it's only, it's only beneficial for the one aspect of uh, when you're training and the full aspect of training is again, the bone density and everything. I think you agree with this and, I, and I'm going to let you answer this, but when it comes to weightlifting for us, and it's been this way, I am assuming the last 10, 20 years, it is about being able to do this for a lifetime. And it's switched from competition in the sense of winning the trophy to, I want to be able to do this for a lifetime and raise family and, and, and be a savage. And I don't want to diminish that, but I also want to be able to elongate the game and learn more. So when I talk about training and stuff, I always try to keep it simple going, yes, you can do 30, 40 reps, but understand that's more of you're focused on only one aspect of life and you're going to miss the whole picture. Is, is that somewhat true or what do you, what's your take? Well, yes, you're, you're probably going to get the hype. You are going to get the hypertrophy benefit from the higher rep sets, but you're not necessarily going to get the tendon and ligament benefit that uh, requires sufficient load. And the bigger piece of this, uh, I think, is that the intensity has to be the same. When I say intensity, the effort, you still have to get within two or three reps of failure, whether you're lifting a very heavy weight for five reps or a medium weight for 12 or a light weight for 25. If you do 10 reps and you could have done 20, that's not a sufficient stimulus. You're, you're not going to respond to it. And I don't want to scare anybody away because here's what we've actually found because I still train clients and I, I work with a lot of people who train clients every day. I, I own a gym, Sin City Iron, cheap plug for Las Vegas, uh, Sin City Iron. We still train, you know, all ages there. And it's actually the most effective way. It's kind of like uh, Mark Ripito's starting strength program is a great program. They just do five by fives. They come in and they put some weight on the bar and they have you do five reps. Uh, you probably couldn't have done seven or eight. So it's a sufficient load that you're going to get a result. And then over time, you add five pounds and you add five pounds. And it's not as though it ever becomes so burdensome. You know, Jordan Fagenbaum said something really interesting from Barbell Medicine. He said that you don't add five pounds to the bar to get stronger. You get stronger so you can add five pounds to the bar. It's a really interesting way to, to look at it. And it was kind of the theory that Louis Simmons uh, worked with at, at uh, Westside Barbell, they did a lot of lifting around the main lift. Uh, they wouldn't always go in and max out and they would do a variety of accessory work or, uh, you know, similar movements to the squat, a box squat, you know, deadlifting is a hip hinge, uh, you know, a lot of good mornings and those kinds of things. So it can be fun. You can use a host of of very similar exercises and then you just test your strength with the squat so you, you don't have analogy. to yeah that, that's just a test you don't you don't have to go in every single week and crush yourself nor should you because then this is one of the big things that i try and avoid with my clients and, and not give them a too challenging of a training program it's what we what we understand to be compensation is that when you train too hard and you know, that's, that's a real nebulous term, but if you go in and crush yourself in a workout, you're more likely to sit more and eat more outside the gym. You'll get hungry and tired. We prescribe training as stimulatory. You should feel refreshed the next day, uh, but have gotten adequate stimulus such that you can still adapt and grow. Okay. So, so I, you're, you're, you just, you're, you're, you're crushing the, the science of it, the understanding of how to train, but I, I'm so scared because I don't think they're going to, what do we say to the young Stan, the young Mike that felt, I know I did, that if I could train harder than anybody else, I'll beat everybody else. 
You know that mentality? If I go yeah. in and crush the workout and absolutely demolish it, um, don't worry. I'll recover quicker than everybody else. I can train more than anybody else. What do you tell them? Because you've given us a blue book, but we're not changing their mindset on, on them going in to crush the weights and going, okay, I get it and stuff, but I can still train harder than you and better than you. What do you tell those people? Well, I think that the progression is important, that you need to train consistently and progress over time, meaning add one set, one rep, uh, one exercise. We call that volume load, sets times reps times weight over time it needs to increase. We see this in, in, you know, this is a recommendation that's going back for decades. It's not new with the science. Uh, Dorian Yates, I think, was probably documented at the best in terms of just starting a uh, you know, a block of training, a 10 week block. And by the end of the 10 weeks, you should have progressed. You should have lifted a little more weight or a few more reps. And otherwise you didn't adapt. You didn't stimulate and adapt and grow any muscle or, or gain any strength. Uh, and in which case you, you need to go back to step one and redesign your program. Overtraining, and, and I hate to say this because a lot of it happens outside the gym. It's, in my mind, it's always been kind of under eating and under sleeping. Uh, we don't know go into that because that's a whole show because I have so <laughs> many questions that I don't care if nobody watches it. I have a million questions about nutrition with you and how you feed, but don't give that to them today. Yeah. No, let me hit a couple more topics on the same, on the same topic. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know, cause they're going to go, okay, so I do volume training and I start day one, January 1st. And by the end of Jan December, uh, 2031st. I'm up to a hundred sets. When is the break? Is well, the, do you believe that you should go 10 to 12 weeks and then restart and then 10 to 12 weeks and restart? What's your thought? That's a great question. It hits on two things that are very important. One is there's a minimum effective volume, meaning that you have to get a sufficient number of sets, reps and intensity to stimulate growth. And there's also a maximum recoverable volume where if you do too many sets and reps and too much weight, that you're not going to be able to recover from it. I call it digging ditches instead of building mountains. That was one of the things that I struggled with, with UFC fighters. Like when I was working with John Jones and I had to go in and, and have a conversation with the folks at Jackson link uh, about the fact that we got to be careful about accumulating fatigue for this athlete because you have limited physical capital to invest. And if you don't recover from the training, then you're not going to progress. You're going to decline. And so uh, there is a maximum recoverable volume and, and, and that's individualistic. And it also, you can adapt over time and increase that uh, and, and should uh, from the training stimulus, you'll get better at it over time, but it's not limitless. And so you do want to measure your progress by, uh, you know, volume load sets times reps times weight over time. And if you plateau, if you stop progressing, if you're unable to get as many repetitions with the same weight, over the same number of sets, uh, then it's time to either, in, you know, again, improve your sleeping and eating or change the exercises slightly because maybe you've adapted to them. Maybe we go from a hack squat to a leg press. You know, maybe we go from a, a, a high bar squat to a low bar squat. There's all sorts of different, that's a great thing about bodybuilding. We have endless tools and they're all just tools. There's no one exercise that's better than the other. They all provide different uh, adaptive stimulus. And we just need to switch every now and then. Now, this isn't P90X. You can't go in every week and do a different exercise and expect to respond. There is what we call a, a, a neural adaptation, a, a coordination that you acquire for the first few times you do an exercise. You just get better at it. You get more practiced. Your body learns to recruit the muscle fibers, and, and you are then able to get, quote, unquote, stronger. But most of that is, is a nervous system adaptation. You have to get past that neural adaptation, which is for an experienced lifter might only be two or three weeks for an inexperienced lifter uh, might be four to six weeks before you start actually building muscle from slowly increasing the load. This is a strategy we use with beginners. This is, I've talked about the, the, the middle-aged men and women or uh, elderly folks or even kids. This is how we get them hooked on lifting. We know it's neural adaptation. We know they're just going to get better at the movement from the first time they try and they're all uncoordinated and they're wavering all over the place trying to do a squat or a deadlift or what have you. Every single week, every single workout, two days later, three days later, they'll be able to do one more rep or a few more pounds and they'll think that they're progressing and they are, they're, they're getting better at the movement. Uh, 
and that's kind of the hook. And within just a short period of, of six weeks to three months, the progression is remarkable. Their coordination, their strength, the number of repetitions they can do, how confident and comfortable they feel in the movements. Uh, and that to me is kind of the hook. And so we always set up a board on the wall. Uh, you see it in most powerlifting gyms. They have uh, the board of, that shows who got the biggest lift. But we set up a board for everyone, not just the strongest person, but every single person in the gym. And every time they come to the gym, we try and set a PR. And a PR can come in many different shapes and, and forms. It can be a single rep PR on a squat, or it could be a five rep PR. It could be a, 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 a variation of the squat. It could be a box squat PR. Uh, it could be a, a trap bar deadlift PR. It could be an incline dumbbell bench PR. You know, and it could be, again, a single or a five or 10 reps. And so we set a whole bunch of different metrics. The names go down the left-hand column and across the top. We might have 10 or 12 different potential PRs they can set that day. And if it's their upper body day, if, if they've decided to break it into upper and lower, we would say, pick a number, pick a PR. We're going to, we're going to break a record today. And it could be a rep PR or a, you know, a single one rep max PR. We don't care. And that's how we keep clients. You, you were talking about how do we keep people interested? Uh, and that's one of the ways that we do that is, is to just have them recognize pr progress alternatively, a lot of folks will come in the gym and they're just doing what we call Metcons. They're just flipping battle ropes around and jumping through, you know, and doing, uh, you know, burpees and whatever else. And uh, somebody's standing there with a whistle and, and it, it's not hard as a trainer to make somebody breathe hard and sweat. Right. But if it's not measurable and progressible, I don't think it's terribly effective. It's just exercise. It's wow. not training. Wow. So, I mean, that's, that's, it's a belief I believe as well. It, it is a tough thing that you can't gauge or measure. And our whole thing would be, can we measure it in a some sense? Uh, like you said, I, you have so many facets to measure. Um, but again, it's, it's a, a, a block of windows. For me, I believe that eight to 12 weeks of getting better and then restarting. I believe, I believe restarting for me and what I believe in about training and stuff is more important than that final stage. Cause the final stage of those last four weeks of the training plan takes care of themselves. You're going to be doing the volume. You're going to be doing the cardio. You're going to be, the diet's going to be perfect. Everything's going to be great, but it's stopping at that point going, I pushed my body to a limit. Now I need to pull back to let my body recover and start off smaller. Now that's my belief. And what I see is, it, what I, I love to see is that I know for me, I love weightlifting. And so it's hard for me to get back to that real start ground. But I see it with Mona walking around at 46, almost 47. And she walks around training three days a week and just looks, well, she's Miss Universe. But it's always that, okay, now let's go to the next level. And she changes so much in eight weeks when her starting point is so fresh and clean and a great um, I guess, foundation. So my question to you is mostly when it comes to uh, these guys that just go to a hundred and then just, they keep the foot down on the pedal and they go, I'm doing all year and I'm doing perfect. And they're in a deficit and they're just, they're grinding it. What's your take on restarting somebody? If you do. Yeah, it depends on the degree of overtraining because that is a thing. You can actually get yourself into a position where it might take you many weeks or, God forbid, a number of months to completely recover from, uh, uh, you know, excess fatigue that you've accumulated from training. So you you got to be careful. There's you certainly need to recognize that, and that's why we constantly test and monitor. Are we progressing that you can do that? What do we say this uh, kind of a leading indicator as power lifters now, one of the most popular ways we do it is we put a, uh, we actually measure velocity of the bar. And so let's say that, that you go in and you know that you can deadlift, you know, 600 pounds for a few repetitions. If the speed significantly slows down, that's a good leading indicator that you may have be overreaching at the time. Uh, or it's not your, you know, you're not actually in your best 
at your best strength at that moment. And again, potentially it could be because stress, diet, nutrition, etc. But you've got to kind of auto-regulate then and say, look, I might need to lower the weight in order to maintain the speed, the bar speed. Uh, and here's an example. If you deadlift, say, 600 pounds at seven meters per second, and then you, you know, you think you got stronger, so you go to six twenty-five, but it goes down to six meters per second, or six fifty, and it goes down to three meters per second. You didn't get stronger; you just exerted more effort, and you were moving the bar slower. Uh, stronger would be, can you get to six twenty-five at six meters per second after you did six hundred for six meters per second? That would be actually stronger. Those are the, and I know this starts to get a little more complicated. Uh, I'm just saying if you've reached that level of expertise, maybe it's time to, to get a good coach that can help you uh, take you to the next level by understanding a lagging indicator would be your resting heart rate in the morning. If it's up eight, 10 beats higher than what it was, you know, the previous few days, it might be a good idea to take a day off. Uh, you'll probably see it in your performance. And th we did this with wrestlers as far back. You remember Les Gutches from Oregon state way back in the, uh, you know, the early, uh, early nineties. Those were the kind of measurements that we were doing back then uh, was, was doing the resting heart rate. But we knew it was a lagging indicator. We knew that they had probably overtrained and we should have stopped yesterday because, you know, now you've got the obvious signs of overreaching. So it's not it's not the end of the world, but take a day off. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we talk about doing deloads every four to five weeks. Maybe you just lift half the weight for half the reps for half the sets. You don't have to completely leave the gym you could and wouldn't lose any strength in one week we we you know we see people going as long as two weeks even at peak performance and not seeing a, a significant decline in strength uh, so I, I just don't think that you need to train as you don't need to train to failure you don't need to max out nearly as often uh, and you can take deload weeks or a week off uh, every six weeks or so and not see a decrement in performance. And so actually, I think, I can't remember if it was, if it was Brad Schoenfeld's work, they had somebody, it was like a 24 week training block and one group trained and they took three, two week hiatuses from the gym during that 24 weeks. They didn't train at all for two weeks, three times throughout that 24 week period. The other group trained st straight through, they had equivalent outcomes in terms of uh, measurable performance improvements. They had equivalent outcomes. And so, you know, that kind of makes you question, uh, how do we make a good analogy to this? Just because you can go 100% doesn't mean it's, you know, or just because you can train harder than the next guy, harder, whatever that means, yeah. and grind yourself and be tired and, uh, you know, fatigued all the time and waking up limping. Uh, just because you can do that doesn't necessarily mean it's the, the most beneficial because, uh, as you know, you know, it's a hormetic effect and you can do too much damage to recover from, and then you're not super compensating. You're just barely recovering from what you've done previously. You wouldn't do that. And in, in say an Indy 500, you wouldn't just floor it until your tires burned off. You go into a pit stop, you change your tires, you get some more gas and, you know, you, you make sure and stay out of the red zone. So you don't uh, burn your engine out. It, it's very similar to that kind of mentality. So for you, would, am I correct to hear that you're saying, uh, not so much back down the sets and volume, um, but do a, a block of training and take a week off and then go back in and start where you you left off. Is that somewhat what you would say? Yeah. And, you know, if you're if you're making progress, if you're continuing to get stronger, and you don't feel like you've gotten tired and your, your weights haven't plateaued. Keep going. There's no sense to stop. Uh, but if progress stalls and you're getting pretty tired, uh, take a deload. Uh, then change. I like to change a variation of the exercise. Like I'll go from a hack squat to a leg press or again, a high bar squat to a low bar. Uh, and I'll run that for six, eight weeks. And I see progression again. It's motivating. You know, it's, it's great. Uh, so I do those kinds of things to that. I've said this many times. And, and this was always has been the case historically for me and a lot of people I trained with. You will take a deload, whether you do it voluntary or <laughs> it, it will happen. And now a voluntary deload, you plan Repeat that out. again, because I knew what was coming and I was trying to duck out that punch. <laughs> Say the whole thing again. Yeah. You and I both know you, you will deload, whether it's voluntarily or involuntarily. 
And let me describe involuntarily. You will get sick or you will get injured, period. You cannot continue to grind like that for, for that long. Uh, you know, God bless you for trying, but it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you can't compete sick or injured. And so one of the things that, like I talked earlier about with John Jones and all the athletes that I've worked with, one of my primary goals is to, is to keep them from, from getting injured or getting sick. And so I have to keep them healthy. And so I'm real cautious about the stimulus. Hey, another interesting study. They took two groups of people, and let's just assume they were both doing 10 sets per week per body part. One group went up to 12 sets per week. The other group went up to 20 sets. They had equivalent responses in performance. It seems that your body's only going to adapt at a particular rate. And we, and we can see this like you can only gain so much muscle so fast right. is right. the problem. That's one of the limiting factors. I don't care you know, if you're eating 3,000 calories and you want to get into a calorie surplus to build muscle, you really only need to go to 3,500, at least initially until your body adapts and then you have to go higher. But if you go to 10,000, you're not going to build any more muscle than 3,500. You're going to build a lot of extra fat. But you know, that, that's, I think, the mistake that people make is they think that they can, they can accelerate the system. I cannot wait to talk to you about nutrition. I cannot wait. Um, let me, this is, you gave so much information, like always, and that's why I love, uh, Stan does me favors and he reads something that he thinks is beneficial. He'll, he'll text me that. We don't say anything. He just texts me that. Um, but it's uh, our relationship. I absolutely value our relationship as, as warriors against each other and as friends um, uh, in all of our conversations before I had my son. Um, but I've loved our 30 year journey. We're going to continue this journey unless, I mean, you could say it right now. Are you going to stop training? I'm not done. No, and I'm not done. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little depressed after watching you smoke 405 incline presses like they're nothing. I, those were the good old days for me, but I'm, I'm holding my own. I'll find something in the gym that I can beat you at, whether it's a ping Mona, pong. <laughs> put up the 500 I just did. Why'd you put the 400? <laughs> Crush you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, man. Uh, outside of the interview and everything, this is, uh, uh, I got, you motivate me in a way that I can't express because there's, there's, uh, I'm in the gym and I'm like, I know what Stan's doing and I'm, doing <laughs> and I know, it, and it's, it's, it's just a, a cool, I don't know, high school varsity standout. And I want to be the best one there. And you're standing right next to me and you beat me on something. I'm like, oh, I'm coming back. So it's it's a great relationship all the way around. But the information you gave today uh, is great. And I'm going to try some of the stuff because I always like to pull back and, and bring the sets down uh, where you're like, maybe try. And I, from what I understand from today is maybe take a week off and just go right back into it. Don't pull back so far. Um, we're going to talk about nutrition next, next week or sometime here, uh, because you have so much knowledge about that, that you are doing something that we had just Dr. Gabrielle on is that you don't run away from food, um, like society does. And I keep trying to tell people, uh, I'm still here because I eat carbohydrates. Um, well, protein, well, yeah, protein's there, but it's the carbohydrates I don't allow my body to run away from. And so I really want to get into depth on that. Is there any final touches today that you would like to uh, just say about building muscle and connective tissue and all of that? Yeah. You know, and again, anybody who hasn't seen my video on Mike O'Hearn, they should watch it. The lessons are in there. The important lesson, and you just said, I know what you're doing and I know what you're doing. And I talked about it in the, in the rant, the same thing that you've been doing for almost 40 years now uh, that I saw you do in the early nineties when I used to come down to gold's Venice and watch you train is the same thing you're doing today. And, and people sometimes, you know, they want to do something different. I call it the shiny object syndrome. They get on Instagram and they see somebody doing something nifty or different. And I, I kind of touched on it today with battle ropes or flinging kettlebells around and look, 
if it's not measurable, and it's not that there's anything wrong with any of those exercises, but they're exercises. It's not training. If it's not measurable and progressible, then you're not growing. You're not getting stronger or bigger. And so, yes, you will do the same thing or slight variations of the same thing and progress those things over time and continue to get bigger and stronger. And it takes a long time and a lot of consistency, discipline, and time management, uh, but it's well worth the effort. I, I, I allowed you for what you've created for the bar that you've set for all of us here now into our 50s. And there's guys 20 years are younger that would love to be where we're at now and would certainly aspire when they're in their 50s to, to be somewhat, uh, you know, fit and capable as we are now in our 50s and, and anticipate being moving forward. So it, it might seem boring, but to some people, because it is not rather repetitive, but not to you and me. And the goals are very small now. They're not huge. I don't anticipate putting on 10 pounds of muscle or adding 100 pounds to my bench. That's not going to happen. But I'll get one more rep or five more pounds. And to me, that's a huge victory. And I set little goals over very short periods of time to two months, three months, the same way I did when I was 17, 18 years old. I always had little goals when I was 140 pounds when I started. When I was 158 pounds after two years of lifting, competing in the lightweight novice class of a bodybuilding show. Tiny you know, little guy, you. <laughs> yeah, I can remember it just struggling and struggling and struggling till the day I weighed 200, which you only weighed that for a day because the next day you woke up, you were 196. <laughs> you know, I remember all of these milestones, you know, very passionate about, uh, you know, all of these, all the effort that we put into this over the years. So I just want people to understand that it has to be a lifestyle. It has to be simple, sensible, and sustainable. Uh, it, you need to enjoy it. It, I've said many times in posts that we don't have to do this. We get to do this. and We're blessed to be able to. And so if you look at it that way, then it doesn't seem like work. I always say the training is the easy part. That's the fun part. You know, being disciplined outside the gym is kind of the harder part, getting sufficient sleep and nutrition, which we'll talk about next time. But I, I sure hope that people will enjoy this. And I, I think that maybe we've given them some tips today that will make this more enjoyable for them and maybe take away some of the stress that is unnecessary in terms of what you don't have to do in order to make progress you know and i just hope that you guys out there watching this that you can feel some of the love i have for this man um i tried to keep mona back there because she's in love with him um it's it's i hope you guys get that kind of friendship with somebody um and and, and have that rivalry with the love and everything and the respect that we have uh, for you guys watching today. I think he is again, a, a, a pinnacle of knowledge of he won the show. He's experienced, he's studied it, but he's also just been able to live it. And I don't think that's beatable uh, to me. And so that's why I always go to him for questions and stuff. And so guys, we're going to give you links to stand everything you guys need to know this man work with him. And, and uh, we're going to continue to do this because nutrition's next. After that, let's go into uh, hormones. Um, yeah, we got a lot to a lot to cover. <laughs> awesome, brother. Thank you so much for the invite. It's always great to get together. Thanks, brother. Are we going to pop the top now or is that it? Uh, we're, we're class baby. Ooh! <laughs> Look, kid. Thanks, brother, for doing this today. So All right. You go take care, my friend, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And we'll hit the uh, yeah, I can't. Where's the gym at? It's in uh, it's in Las Vegas over by the airport on uh, Eastern and Patrick. And it's uh, it's got all the goodies in there every bar and exercise that you'd ever want, every fancy uh, thing that we need, you know, custom, custom thing you won't get at a box gym. Good. Then we'll come over in a couple of weeks then and uh, give Gavin my best, slap him upside the head for me. Will do. How great is he? He's awesome. He's the best. Yeah, he just hit me up yesterday. We got to get back at it. All right. Go play, brother. Thanks again. All right. Take care, brother. Rep range answered today. Uh, intensity answered today. And the whole thing about overtraining uh, I know you guys think that you can out-train everybody else. That's not what this is about. Be smart, train hard. Everything is answered today. This this should set you up to win now. 
um, remember to recover. And again, I think the, the greatest thing he said was, you're going to take a week off or a deload week if you want to or not. We'll see you next week. Enjoy, subscribe, and remember, Titan Crew right here.